Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Luke Johnson and Dr. Jonathan Cook. Tonight, we will be speaking about Rudyard Kipling's Kim, a continuation of our previous episode. We did Plain Tales from the Hills by Rudyard Kipling. This is our uh, second installment in the work of Rudyard Kipling. And I guess, since Dr. Cook chose it, maybe we should just start off with, why did you choose it, Dr. Cook? Okay, so... Kim is uh, Kipling's best novel out of the four he wrote. It's the one that really has the claim to be studied and uh, reread in a way that some of his other fiction has has kind of dated itself. I mean, he he wrote um, you know three other novels are interesting, but they're they're not really. Um, ones you can reread with pleasure. Um, the previous one, uh, Captain's Courageous, is a, it's an adventure story about uh, cod fishing in the North Atlantic, and uh, it's a it's a story of a initiation of a young man, a spoiled young man who uh, whose boat is run over, or he falls overboard from an Atlantic cruise and uh, is picked up by some sailors, uh, fishermen, and is initiated into the, into the business of, you know, um, commercial fishing. So anyway, it's an entertaining book, um, but Kim has more depth to it and um, is really the book where I think most, a lot of people feel it, Kipling was kind of cutting loose from his his sort of defensive posture about the British Empire that he was he was allowing himself to sort of look at India from all kinds of angles. I, I mean, even though he's showing Kim to be a patriotic uh, subject of the British Empire, um, he's really allowing himself to just portray the the incredible diversity of cultures and religions and peoples that made up British India in the in the 19th century. Of course, we're talking about the 1880s, 1890s. Um, There's a little bit of a controversy about whether it was said in the late 1880s um, or 1890s. I think more likely now people are thinking in the 1890s in terms of looking at some historical context. Of course, it was published in 1901. Um, when Kipling was, you know, one of the most read writers of English literature, came out in two magazines first, serialized in McClure's Magazine and Casals Magazine in England, McClure's in the U.S., and then publishes a book in 1901. And so this was um, when Kipling was still pretty broadly popular with the British. I mean, he kind of went into eclipse after World War One, and his brand of... Um, you know, patriotic devotion to the empire became more um, criticized and suspect amongst you know new writers in the 1920s. He, he, he where, where that. was he physically when he was writing this? He was in uh, Sussex in southern England. You know, he come back from the U.S. in 1896 because of problems uh, with his brother-in-law, who was a drunk and confronted him on the on the roads in Vermont where he was living and insulted him. And then uh, there were some issues with the U.S. and sort of warlike rumblings between the U.S. and England in 1896 over uh, Venezuela, so disputes about whether the U.S. would, would invoke the, the Monroe Doctrine to... Uh, to determine a boundary line for British Guiana. So Kipling was upset that the U.S. and England were were fighting uh, over um, this diplomatic issue. So he went back to England. Sorry, I've got this thing that comes up. Um, went back to England um, uh, and then settled, settled down in... Devon, uh, down on the southwestern coast of England, and then eventually migrated over to Sussex near Brighton. He, he lived in a town called Rotterdean, uh, near the co- southern coast, near the Channel. 
and uh, so he was living there. He'd gone back to the U.S. in 1899 uh, to to. Uh, talk to his publishers and to to visit family you know his his wife was american and um but he when he was in new york he got sick uh with pneumonia and his daughter got sick unfortunately his daughter died he survived so he was really a a very grieving man in uh in the late uh at the end of the 19th century and was was writing Kim, you know, after his daughter had died a year or so before, and um, so um, well, that would be pretty... that's an interesting tie-in given some of the the themes about uh, Hindu philosophy that occur. Hindu, yeah, about the wheel of suffering. Exactly, the, the Lama who is teaching, you know, transcendence. Mm-hmm. You know, Buddhist transcendence as a Lama, and yeah, that's an interesting idea because Kipling himself was was deeply grieving for his daughter. You know, he he lost his son in the Second World War, uh, so only one of his three children survived him. And um, so anyway, Kim, you know, he was writing about India, even though he hadn't been there for a number of years. I mean, he was immersed in Indian culture when he was uh, ages, you know, zero to six. And then he went back to England and then he came back at the age of 16 till about the age of 24. Um, and then he left, you know, came back, went back to England, went to the U.S., married, lived in Vermont for four years. And I was interested to see that you can actually rent Kipling's house in Vermont, this place that he built it's a long narrow structure actually quite a, an attractive house with some beautiful views um and he wrote the jungle books there and he he kind of designed it to be like an ark uh huh. that you know would contain all these animals but you can you can rent it uh i don't think it's on airbnb but you you can find it <laughs> I, I'm, it's probably pretty expensive but uh it's interesting that the whoever owns it is now renting it out to people in just above in uh Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh so anyway, he was he was in the US for 4 years, went back to England in what 1896 and um wrote Captain's Courageous, um wrote continued to write stories and then wrote Kim in uh 1900, published in 1901. So, uh, how do we classify Kim? Yeah, well, uh, Kipling is writing, uh, he's writing a buildings roman, which is a novel of uh, personal growth for young, usually young men, could be a young woman, but it's usually following the education of a, a young uh, teenager as they way, make their way towards adulthood and learn the ropes often there's a love affair that goes badly often there's interaction with an urban environment um and uh but usually by the end of the book the hero has gained the confidence to survive in an uncertain world uh so kim is 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 sort of a buildings roman even though it ends when he's about 16 or 17 but he's integrated into the British colonial system as an accomplished undercover agent and uh, in the guise of a surveyor uh, where he's got, you know, he's got training to do that. So, you know, typical buildings, Romans are like um, David Copperfield or Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, uh, books that... uh, follow the progress of a, a young a boy uh, into manhood. Uh, of course, the first, you know, the creator of the form pretty much was Goethe's uh, Wilhelm Meister, you know, which is a four-volume story about the this young man named Wilhelm Meister and his, his travels and his education, his love affairs and whatnot. So, but it also has some picaresque elements, and picaresque, of course, is the form of fiction that came out of Spain and the 
16th century about the picaro is a rogue who is kind of living on the fringes of society and surviving by uh, hand-to-mouth uh, mode of life. And uh, it tells you, it's, it, it typically has a very episodic structure, so that it doesn't necessarily have a well-shaped plot, but just one thing leads to another. And it often has some humorous elements to it. But the hero of that book is is sort of a marginalized figure in society. So for Kim, you know, he's an orphan who's living as a, as a kind of a beggar on the streets of Lahore, which is now in Pakistan. At the time, it was part of British India. And um, so he's, he's marginalized in that, uh, you know, he's 13 years old at the beginning of the book. He is sort of between, he's a son of a white couple, you know, Irish soldier and his wife who have died and he's been raised in India kind of on the street. So he's kind of like a street urchin, but he's white, even though people can mistake him for being Indian. Um, So he has this sort of racial um, privilege that, Indian, native Indians wouldn't have, but he doesn't necessarily assert it. Um, And he, you know, he's really, you know, throughout the book, he's, he's definitely living on the margins of the Indian world. He's not integrated into any um, cultural system until he goes to school for a while. And at this place in Lucknow, the St. Xavier's Academy, which was uh, based on another Catholic school there, um, so it's the dynamic of those two forms that work out in the book, you know, the Buildings Roman, or the the coming of age novel, and the and the picaresque novel, which, you know, you find in in a fair number of books. I mean, the Melville's novel Redburn could be described as a combination of Buildings Roman and and picaresque. Sure. So it's it wasn't unusual as a form, but Kipling wasn't a master plotter. He was. He was more of a kind of a stream of consciousness writer who who just you know he was trained as a reporter in India when he went back at the age of sixteen he got uh, his employment for several years was on uh, you know newspaper uh, journalism so he was very good at sort of meticulous reporting about Indian and Anglo Indian life. Um, so it's, you know, he's not a Henry James in terms of his plots, but he's a, he's a superb reporter of things Indian or, you know, other, other subject matter that he wrote about. What I thought was interesting about this one, and I want you to elaborate on this, uh, kind of the differences in the portrayal of the colonial role in India from say Plain Tales from the Hill and this one. But what I thought was interesting, we get a little bit more of a, uh, of a pronounced Freemasonry in, in yeah, Ken. Yeah. It's the the lodge uh, comes up a great deal in it. Um, I don't know if yeah, there's any. The, I don't know if that is connected to how we're supposed to understand the colonial role in India, but it it seems to be an, a recurring theme throughout the text. Well, it's interesting because, yeah, Kipling was joined a Masonic Lodge, I think about the age of 20, and one of the things he liked about it was that it was where you could meet other local people without the burden of caste uh, keeping you apart. So you could have, you know, English and Hindus and Muslims and Jews and Jains and Buddhists, they could all join and they could all interact in a way that they could never do on the, you know, in the streets of India because they were all, certainly in the Hindus were all very confined to their class or their caste uh, category. I mean, you, you know, Britain, Britain had a class, this class society, but India was, you know, had dozens of these castes that were just incredibly... Um, um, powerful social determinants of of your whole life, you know. Um, so uh, that's what Kipling enjoyed with Freemasonry. So, 
Yeah, the you know the reason he is recognized uh, when he finds the Irish uh, soldiers who are in the uh, Maverick Brigade, so called that his father was in, was that you know there were some Masonic messages in his the uh, amulet that he wore around his neck, and so he was he was sort of integrated because he was given this. Uh, sort of recognition that he was one of the one of the guys, you know, so integrated into the Masonic realm. But so you know, one of the things the the advantages of reading Kim is getting an understanding of the religious pr- plurality of India, which is, uh, as I said, was something that he appreciated and he he loved Kipling just. You know, you love the diversity of Indian culture that he could just move around in it. I mean, he was one of the of the privileged English rulers, but as a newspaper reporter, he just you know he got around also in his Masonic lodge. He could interact with all kinds of different people. Um, but I don't I don't remember the other signs of Masonic influence besides those elements and his recognition it's it's very by, subtle it's just it's just yeah. here and there you know it, yeah. it becomes i'm interested in it because it becomes obviously uh, a dominant theme in in the man yeah. that would be king so, well yeah. it's interesting because you know buddhism is an important uh subject and theme in the book with the lama sure as his spiritual guide and you know, Buddhism is sort of working your way sort of out of the circle of suffering into something higher. And of course, free, Freemasonry, you're always rising to a different degree. Right. You know, moving through a hierarchy of of achievement through your virtuous acts. So there's kind of a weird symbiosis between the, the two of them. Well, I think, I think both uh, paths are interested in what they perceive to be enlightenment, right? Yeah, I, enlightenment, what I, yeah. So what I understand about masonry as you proceed through the gradations is that you keep asking for more light yeah. and, until, you know, you find out what that light is. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, but uh, did we address the question of how this might be a departure uh, from his, his previous depiction of colonial rule in India? Did we address that yeah. enough? Well, it's, uh, you know, I his think, earlier stories, there's a lot of st- stories about British soldiers, there's stories about romantic intrigue, there's stories, uh, the pathos of some Indian characters who who suffer because of the British rule, but it's not really an implicit criticism of the whole Raj. Um, but this is, uh, this is a different angle in that the bigger picture, of course, is a, a political one, which is the British rivalry with, with Russia over um, uh, centered around Afghanistan and what was called the Great Game. The, the 19, it was kind of like a 19th century Cold War between Britain and Russia uh, because Britain was paranoid about Russia coming, invading India, taking their prized possession uh, you know, an integral part of their economy by the late 19th century. And, of course, that was irrelevant after, I think, about 1907 when they signed an entente with Russia because Germany was now the 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 threatening power, right? So in the story, it's, of course, you know, Russia who's the rival to the north and they have to keep... Um, the native princes in the northern kingdoms that they don't rule directly, they have to keep them um, amenable to British rule. They don't want them allying themselves with Russia and giving them access, putting these these uh, districts, uh, giving them access to Russian uh, troops coming down. Um, and of course, you know, Britain had fought Russia in the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. So this was kind of a continuation of that rivalry. And there, you know, the borders between British India and Russia got closer and closer within a few hundred miles or even less of each other with Afghanistan kind of as the as the barrier now uh, so, between them. So that's the that's the sort of political 
background, which was a big issue at the time, 1890s. A lot of, you know, Kipling knew a lot of military guys, and uh, there, a lot of them were writing books about what Britain had to do to beef up their army and to, uh, um, to recognize the fragility and the vulnerability of, of their empire because here, you know, they had a quarter of the land mass of the, of the world was under British rule. So they, they couldn't concentrate their armies in any one place. They were all scattered around the world. So they, you know, if there's any trouble in India, they, they had to bring people from elsewhere into, to fight. Right. That's the first I've heard of this great game thing. I, didn't even yeah. know Russia was a player in that part of the world, but obviously it makes sense, everything that you're saying. Yeah, there are a couple of books about it, and it's quite elaborate. You know, it began in the early 19th century, and, you know, Britain Britain fought two or three Afghan wars, one in, uh, what, 1839 to 42, and then 1886 to 87. So um, they, uh, there was a lot of, anxiety about what the Russians were doing to the north, um, you know, to keep their empire safe. Man, what is going on in Afghanistan? We just keep going back there. Yeah, yeah. God, what a, who knows what's going to happen in the next year. Probably the Taliban is going to take it over, and but <clears throat> we'll see. <laughs> So, yeah, we need to know more about that part of the world. I mean, you know, this novel is good because it makes you take out a map of India and say, oh, wow, yeah. this is this is where all these places are that you, you know, major cities uh, that you you don't know about if you haven't visited India. Yeah. Well, you know, so you, we talked about the Lama earlier, and that was sort of a point of that was perplexing to me as I was reading this. I was like, why am I getting so much about Buddhism, about Buddhism, yeah. From when about a story that's taking place in India, um, or the subcontinent, and I and perhaps I have like an impoverished understanding of the uh, distribution of adherence to faith in in India, um, or maybe the maybe the demographics have changed. I I just I was like, why are we talking about Chinese air, air quotes Chinese stuff <laughs> when we're talking? Well, about there India? was a vogue. There was a vogue for Buddhism amongst uh, the British. There was a, a poem, a very popular poem, best-selling poem called The Light uh, in Asia about the life of Buddha by a guy named, I think it was N Edward, Edwin Arnold. Anyway, very popular poem. So, And there was all kinds of interest in, in Buddhism, partly because of the occupation of India. So yeah, there you know not a lot of Buddhists in in India, of course, but of course the Buddha was from India, and he you know he his religion was that's true, um, that's true. I, I, uh, I had I, a lot of similarities to the Hinduism. You know, he grew out of the Hindu tradition. I, I forget, I forget about that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the, yeah, so you know, Buddhism got it got the the lamas up there in uh, Tibet. Um, but I, I, it would be interesting to know how many people like that were circulating in, in India in the late 19th century. Um, you know, holy men like that. I mean, India is famous for all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, Islamic, Hindu, holy men, Jain, mm -hmm. holy men, Sikhs. Uh, and who knows how many Buddhists roaming around like that. But well, there, uh, I, just, I just looked it up and apparently... They're saying they're saying uh, about seven and a half million uh, Buddhists in, currently in India. Uh, currently in India, Most, yeah. Uh, but mostly well, like the north, looks yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, north, uh, northeast, next to uh, in the hill country there. Yeah, well, that's that's a fair number. They they oh, practice uh, Vajrayana or Way of the Lightning Bolt. Huh. Yeah, the thing about Buddhism is every every area, every region has its own uh, emphasis and own practices. So that's crazy. I, don't know. I didn't know there was such a such diversity a, in bu Buddhism. The yeah. way of the lightning bolt that and that just opens up a whole can of worms. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah. So what did you think of the of the llama? I mean, he's he. Um, I liked it. I mean, I liked how he's. You know, I, I liked the constant reference to the wheel of suffering and the yeah and and and, and his search it, for the river. Yeah. You know yeah. where Buddha shot his arrow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, like. I mean, I I I like I like uh, world religion and philosophy. So. Yeah. Kind of makes me think of, uh, uh, you know, some later writings of Herman Hesse. You know, he wrote of course, yeah. Sid, Sid Artha, famous book. And his, his novels are all about these spiritual quests by these, <clears throat> you know, German youth who have <clears throat> a, a sort of anxiety about their soul and curiosity about other religions. Right. Um, so uh, there was a whole, I think, you know, movement or across Europe, uh, curiosity about Buddhism uh, at the time, and uh, so this guy is. Uh, I mean, he's kind of a stereotypical character, but he's he's there with. I mean, he's he has a personality of his own, and um, he gives you a, a real sense of what you know, a holy figure, a, a lama would, would be like, you know, today we have the Dalai Lama, we don't hear about other lamas. Um, but the Dalai Lama, you know, is kind of like the ultimate <clears throat> arbiter of ethical behavior, right? <laughs> Probably right. more than the, more than the Pope these days. <clears throat> right. He's got, he's got less doctrine, less, less doctrinal baggage to carry around. Well, uh, he, he can, He's a uh, adaptable, right? Like I think, uh, yeah. I think some quotes that I've heard from the Dalai Lama over the years is that his is that Buddhism can often change with evolving understandings of what science is. Yeah. So I think this is what appeals to a lot of people too. So you know, I've seen all these books about uh, Buddhism and quantum physics or chaos theory and stuff like yeah. that. You, yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if I see them so much now, but I I think there was a period when there was like people were trying to blend Eastern philosophy with, uh, yeah, with physics. definitely started yeah. in the '60s. So one of the interesting uh, questions about the book and the and the Lama is, you know, some people read this book, particularly that today they read it as though it has this grand ironical finale because, <clears throat> of course, the Buddha finds I'm sorry the the Lama finds his river <clears throat> and has this cleansing experience and has this vision uh, of ultimate you know salvation but of course he doesn't chooses not to to die at that point he's rescued from drowning actually um, and so he reaches his fulfillment and and Kim of course is his pupil you know, he's Chela, which is his assistant. So the question is, you know, Kim is supposed to be being brought along to enlightenment by his spiritual leader, but what is really happening is he's becoming a successful recruit to the British uh, Secret Service as a spy. So right. is there a grand irony there that Kim is becoming a professional... Uh, uh, spy in lieu of having spiritual enlightenment. You know, is it a joke on the Lama that his pupil is that he has no idea is happening? Of course, that his pupil has become a, a very accomplished, uh, successful agent of of British imperialism. You know, so he's sort of helping keep maintain imperial rule. I don't know, you know, when reach, when you reach the end of the novel, I, I that's kind of some ideological baggage that only an academic reader, I think, would have on their minds. But uh, that's what I think contemporary academic critics are saying that, you know, Kim kind of sells out because he's not he's on a, not on a spiritual path. He's on an imperial path of helping the the Raj maintain power, of course. Kipling was com completely committed to British rule in India. He thought it was benevolent. You know, his father worked in a museum there. His father is the model for the keeper of the museum in, in Lahore in the beginning of the book, you know, when the Lama goes in and looks at these Greco 
uh, Buddhist sculptures. This kindly white bearded man is based on Kipling's father, who was uh, you know trained as a an architectural sculptor and an art historian. So. Um, Anyway, you know, I mean, it kind of has a happy ending because both characters get um, are successful in in their pursuit. But of course, Kim's underground assignment is kn- known only to the circle of people who are working with him, like uh, Hurry uh, Babu, uh, Hurry Krishnamurti, the the uh, the Hindu who is his immediate. Uh, contact person <clears throat> and uh, the other Afghan or Pathan agent um, Mahbub Ali uh, a Muslim so um, Kim you know he's successful in what he does he, he they encounter these two guys who are coming along with <clears throat> compromising documents who were themselves spies, one a Russian, one a Frenchman. And he pulls off a a heist of the documents that he's going to pass on to his handlers. Um, ultimately, this guy, Colonel Creighton, who's the guy who recruited him <clears throat> formally. So anyway, I don't know, what was your reaction when Kim, at the end of the book, it it, it kind of leaves you hanging because you don't, you know, no one dies. It seems like the Lama almost dies. Kim seems to be recovering from illness after his trek from the hills with with the Lama. <clears throat> but it just sort of uh, ends without any indication of where each of them are headed after that. Yeah. Uh... Did you feel like you were left hanging? Uh, in an I, you, know, you know, I, uh, not really, you know, I guess the, I guess I'm okay with the incomplete, the seeming incompleteness of works. I have grown and perhaps this is the wrong assumption with Kipling. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be charitable with him. Uh, what I have learned through, uh, my, s- uh, uh, recent interest in film, uh, I, I've gotten really into David Lynch and Stanley Kubrick over the past couple of years. And I have, at least in regards to film, what I have done is I understand that all those films are in conversation with one another. Uh And though I may find individual films to be a letdown or an incomplete, they might be somehow part of a larger puzzle that that director is trying to assemble but he breaks it off in chunks and i guess i wonder about i wonder if this now people could argue that that's not what's going on with kubrick and and lynch and other filmmakers but i i guess i'm okay if uh, there's ambiguity at the end of a text yeah. like this because i i don't know enough about kipling's authorship to know that it doesn't get picked up somewhere else you know or that it's fused yeah. to, that it's a puzzle piece I don't know if that's the right way to look at Kipling. You know, I've, I've seen the movie, uh, The Man That Would Be King, and I've read these two books that we talked about and a little bit of poetry. And interestingly yeah. enough, one of, there's a reference to one of Kipling's uh, poems in a Kubrick movie, uh, uh-huh. White Man's Burden in The Shining. So huh. I guess I'm just kind of along for the ride with Kipling and, yeah, seeing I'm I'm trying to see like the larger thing that he's trying to paint, and I yeah. Well, but, someone actually wrote a sequel to <clears throat> to uh, Kim to did, follow the character, but not as Kipling a, as as an agent. Yeah, now as following up the character of Kim in the Secret Service of oh. of Imperial India. When did that because, happen? Was I that, think it was like in the 80s, so not that you know, not pretty far after. Did. Um, you know that did anyone have a problem with that did anybody object to that because i (laughs) because i've I've been doing a lot of stuff with salinger yeah and uh apparently i forget where this guy's from i don't know he's in sweden or whatever but this guy claimed to have written the sequel to catcher in the rye and apparently it caused a it was like catcher in the rye 60 years later he goes by the name of john david california 
and apparently the Salinger estate like lost their minds and like yeah. sued yeah. him like they crazy. Were, like they you were can't, so protective, it's ridiculous. Yeah, like yeah. you can't even get the book in the United <clears throat> States. Really. Yeah. Like you have to like, you know, have somebody from Germany send it to you on eBay or something. I'm not sure. I don't have a copy of it, but um, yeah. So I, I were there no. Well, was there any? Pro- I don't. I don't. I don't know. I've just. I've just noticed it, so I haven't read it. Hmm. Uh, there are also two film versions which I haven't seen. Um, oh, who's who's one. in the who's in the film stuff? I I, uh, I would have watched it. Check that. Uh, yeah, I think there's one from the fifties, early on. You know, when it was considered kind of a boys' book before people were reading it seriously. Yeah, there's the 1951. That MGM made with uh, it was directed by Victor Seville, produced by Leo Leon Gordon. Uh, who who starred in it? The film starred Errol Flynn, Dean Stockwell, oh, and Paul Errol Lucas. Flynn, wow, yeah, yeah. Dean so yeah, that's one of those '50s movies of of literary classics. It had Dean are... Stockwell in it, the guy from freaking Quantum Leap. <laughs> that oh my gosh, you don't know well, what kind guess... of rabbit hole you just opened up here. Cause, well, I guess cause, we'll cause, have to take a look at it sometime. So, so, so Dean Stockwell is one of the. So we talked about how Kipling has the white man's burden connection yeah. to The Shining. Yeah. And so Dean Stockwell is one of the major like recurring character players in David Lynch's films. Oh, really? So like he, he like he's in Blue Velvet uh-huh. and uh, as an older guy. Uh, yeah, I think he's he, not I, that old. Not that old. I mean, I think he's in his. I think he's think he's in 40s, his fifty fifties in yeah. in in uh in Blue Velvet. I'm trying to remember. I think he's also in Dune. He's in Lynch's Dune. Yeah, yeah, he's in Dune as well. So like, you've got this intersection of Kubrick, Lynch, and Kipling. I think th- there's got to be more Kipling stuff with yeah. Kubrick. But I, well, you see Kipling a lot of places where you you uh, wouldn't expect him. I mean, he was, you know, very popular, very one of the most popular writers at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. And a lot of people have sort of, you know, secretly expressed admiration of, of his work or, you know, read him when they were young and then turned against him and then read him later with more affection. Um. But uh, yeah, he certainly doesn't deserve to be dismissed as a some kind of frothing imperialist idiot, you know, because he's he's not. He's a he's an artist, and uh, uh, you know, you you can find a fair number of books about his fiction in academic libraries. So there's a lot to to learn. There. Sure, sure. So you know, Mark Twain, a fellow Mason. Uh, yeah, he 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 had an influence on his his yeah, writing. Well, one of the one of the reasons that Kipling wanted to come to the U.S. in the late 1880s was to see Mark Twain. So he actually went to Elmira, New York, where Twain was at his summer uh, you know, cabin where he wrote, and just went up to the house and introduced himself. And Twain, I guess he was used to people like this. They sat down and had a long conversation and became kind of friends. I mean, I don't think they were that, you know, close, but Kipling admired, you know, uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. And, uh, you know, both of them were kind of imperial entertainers. I mean, Twain wrote travel books about, uh, you know, around the, what, following the equator and Innocence Abroad. A lot of his writing was was travel-based. And he could be very entertaining, and uh, you know he was not a, he was not he was anti-imperialist actually because of you know his opposition to the um, war in the Philippines in the early 20th century. But he and Kipling got along very well, and so uh, basically the friendship of Kim and the and the Lama is kind of roughly based on Huck Finn and Jim on the raft. Because both of them are in the in Kipling's novel, they're going down the Grand Trunk Road, which goes from Peshawar up in near Afghanistan down to Calcutta. You know, this makes this huge 
thousand mile swath uh, cuts this uh, diagonal line going south east across India and so they're going down that you know they're on the train of course the train is kind of the equivalent of being on the raft on the Mississippi because they they have these encounters with the local people some of them are comic some of them are serious and uh, just as Huck is a sort of, uh, um, he's an orphan of sort of Irish pedigree uh, or lack thereof, Kim is also the, the son of, you know, parents who've died earlier. Um, so both writers chose a sort of marginal character within uh, the you know, Anglo-Saxon world and uh, wrote about their interaction with an older, wiser individual. Of course, Jim is not a, you know, he's not a super religious person, but he's he's a moral um, authority to huck in certain key situations. And each of them are helping each other. You know, huck is helping Jim escape uh, slavery, even though they made a mistake of going down the river, not turning north at Cairo, you know, to go up the Ohio River. And uh, Jim is benefiting from Huck's, um, you know, assistance doing various things and, you know, being the, the person to guide the raft when he has to hide in the, in the tent. So anyway, a loose uh, correlation there, I think, you know, definitely an influence I need to um, I need to go back and read Huckleberry Finn. Read, I, yeah, yeah. I, the uh, I'm taking notes on Kubrick's early films, and uh, I just I just finished uh, Fear and Desire. I don't know if you ever seen it. It was his first feature no. film. No. And uh, there there there's a going down a river on a raft scene, and there's an invocation of Huckleberry Finn. Oh, Huckleberry like, Finn. Yeah. Yeah. So I need to need to brush up on that, but. Well, Kipling was, I mean, he, he was very much a, um, a gifted chronicler of boyhood, just like Twain was. You know, Twain excelled uh, talking about adolescence and was often considered, you know, a boy at heart himself. And Kipling also wrote about boys and young men. Um, you know, he wrote a whole series of stories about uh, these boys in the school called Stalky and Company. In the late uh, 1890s, um, and uh, he, uh, you know, some of his stories are about young men in the coming to India from Britain and being kind of initiated into romantic life there, or the miseries of of soldiering and administration, in some cases. Um, also, his book, you know, Captain's Courageous, is about the initiation of a young, a teenage boy into the hardships of life from his very privileged position. So, he, uh, you know, it was a good time to be writing books about boyhood. It, did, um, why did why did they write so much about that subject? Was there well, was there an audience for it? Was well, the, it, was it you for know, money, or books, was it? Did they have something about themselves they were trying to work out? Like, I think they knew there was an audience for it. You know, readers were usually yeah. a lot of reading that was purchased was for family reading. I mean, That's, you had to f appeal to the female market. So if you're writing about boyhood, you know, you could potentially appeal to the the mothers who wanted to read about read to their children, you know, stories about growing up. Um, yeah, that's a good question, though. Uh, I think there was a sense for for Kipling about, uh, you know, initiating young boys into the, the rule of empire, you know, having the moral fortitude to keep this empire going because you had a ton of soldiers and administrators who had to be very well trained to keep the whole thing, you know, afloat, because this was a massive operation. So um, I think Kipling, you know, he's friends with a guy who started the Boy Scouts, Baden Powell. Really? They buddy yeah, they were buddies. And huh. uh, Kipling actually wrote a little bit, um, uh, I think, some journalism to promote the Boy Scouts. 
so the idea was, yeah, British young men have to train to take on the burden of ruling this amazingly complex, you know, empire that they they had by the turn of the century. You know, a quarter of the world was was sure. <laughs> under their administration. Sure, sure. Um, well, we brought this up earlier. I mean, you, you mentioned that there someone had gone off and created a sequel to Kim, but you know, generally, how does this fit into? Well, I guess you got work. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we've talked about it a little bit with Captain Courageous, and but yeah, yeah, maybe he, there's more to be he, said. I I don't know. Maybe we've covered that pretty well already. You, you tell me. Well, um, in the early 20th century, um, Kipling, uh, I mean, he was writing a lot of poetry while he was writing fiction. Right. And he was getting more and more caught up in the need for Britain to prepare for war with Germany. So he, um, you know, he his best, his best fiction was kind of done by World War I, 18, 1914. And of course, his son died very early in the war. His son, you know, was very nearsighted like his father. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Kipling pulled strings to get him in the army and then he died on his first day of battle. And so Kipling devoted a lot of massive amount of time and energy to write a two volume history of his regiment as a memorial to his, um, sorry, no problem. a memorial to his son's uh, service. Uh, so he got sidetracked with that. Um, and, um, uh, so yeah, uh, I'd say Kim pretty much fits in with his writing in the 1890s. I have to say, given how much he lost with his children, he's still remarkably composed. He's not, he doesn't strike me as a very, uh, emo yeah. emotional writer. Not to say there aren't moments of tenderness and other yeah. feelings, but he's not like losing his mind over the grief of his yeah. dead children. It, it seems well, to me. It seems to me. He was. Um, I mean, his emotional life. He he was subject to some serious depression, apparently throughout his life, and uh, so yeah, I think you know in the 1920s he was he was kind of a beaten man. I mean, he kept going yeah. with uh, various books and, he, you know, autobiography that he published at the end of his life. But, you know, just like Mark Twain lost his daughter in the 1890s, that shattered him, but he still went on. He still had to keep writing to keep the family afloat. Sure. Um, that was, you know, losing uh, his first Susie, his first daughter, uh, was just shattering for him. Then, then his wife, of course, died and his his other daughter was a epileptic and you know she eventually drowned in a bathtub and he was all alone by the end of his life but still kept his sense of humor even though it was very bitter you know what's so fascinating to me i when i was doing some research on mark twain a while ago like i found out he had a brother named orion Orion, yeah, who was I, the, uh, it's like so so like Mark Twain like came in and left on Halley's Comet or something, and he also had yeah. a brother named after a star system like or a constellation. I'm just like, man, yeah, Orion, what's going on yeah. with Orion Clemens? Well, you if don't you go you, to, if you read Roughing It. It's about his his uh, attempt to uh, make a fortune in the in the uh, district of or the territory of Nevada, where his brother was actually the territorial governor. So his, his brother was appointed by Lincoln to be a territorial governor. So he's a very competent uh, administrator. You don't really hear much about him. No. Uh, but um, he was, yeah, Twain went out there so he could you know, make a fortune uh, making, uh, discovering a new silver load. Uh, but instead he became a journalist. So... Maybe we can tie these two questions together. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, it's, if anyone's listened this far into the podcast, I think they understand what they can learn from Kim. I mean, I think it's a great, uh, you know, it's a great introduction into the, the uh, political tensions, like you mentioned, that are going on between uh, multiple world powers. I think it's a great, it seems like, a great read to understand the plurality of faiths in the subcontinent. We've covered that. Um, 
uh, you know, how infiltration happens through intelligence agencies. I mean, that's fascinating. There's so many things that are interesting about this stuff, but is there, is there any, any major reason that we've left out here? Like, like to convince someone like why they ought to read Kim. <laughs> I mean, I think we've done a well, pretty, I think we've done. If you want to know about India. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you read the classics of fiction in English. There's a, it's pretty much, um, uh, you know, Kim and, um, Passage to India of E.M. Forster, you know, that's, mm. the, that's the one, it's, you know, it's a more modern book, uh, and it's anti-imperialistic, so Kim is kind of the other side of the coin, the sort of pro-British, uh, mildly pro-British uh, view of India as an imperial realm. Um, of course, you do need to read the book in a, you know, in annotated edition because of all the ge geography and language that you need to know. So uh, fortunately, there's a good Norton critical edition available and also a Penguin and an Oxford World Classic. So any of those will give you a good handle on, you know, the, the, um, uh, the older, uh, the language and the geography that you need to know about. Definitely. Um, so, so, so yeah, you know, you get a glimpse of just the incredible diversity of Indian culture and I get the sense uh, that Kim is still ha held in high esteem amongst literary critics. I, I, but I could be wrong. I mean, I, uh, I, I, uh, spent a lot of time at McKay's books out in Manassas, uh, trading in a lot of books, picking up a couple and there were, there were numerous copies of Kim. So, yeah. Okay. So, 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 so it's people, being read, yeah. people are reading Kim. I don't know if it's, you know, part of every undergraduate course. It sounds like it is if it's like our, our, our aperture well, it's, in to it's usually India. taught in, you know, these days it's taught in sort of courses on colonialism. Um, but, um, you, uh, an interesting fact is that, um, during the early Vietnam war, some of the early, um, people who were in the CIA who were assessing the need for more troops in Vietnam were big Kim fans, like a guy named James Roosevelt, the son of the president, who who was he, hugely uh, devoted to the book and thought of Vietnam and the communist threat as sort of a new version of the great game. So there was a, a kind of uh, early... 60s CIA um, brotherhood of readers of Kipling's Kim. It's kind of interesting. And I found out about this in Christopher Benfey's very good biography of Kipling in the U.S. called If, Kipling's American Years. A very good book came out a couple of years ago um, about um, the years Kipling spent in the U.S. in the 1890s. Uh, so that's at the end of that story. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to. Unusual. Go yeah, I'm gonna have to go down that rabbit trail. You know, <laughs> I'm. You know, Vietnam. So on you. Yeah, Vietnam's on my mind a lot because of Full Metal Jacket. So. Yeah. Uh huh. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, well, that's a kind of crazy idea that a book from 1901 about <clears throat> Russians in India would be championed or become a kind of a cult book among CIA agents. Oh, that's not, surpri that's not surprising. 1960s. That's not surprising There's to me at all. I spent a lot of time in the CIA reading room. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a good time. It's a good time. <laughs> it's yeah, you know, uh, you'll find some wild so, stuff there. Well, yeah. So I, know, you know, Kipling is kind of inching away his way back into the canon, but he he will never, you know, have the place that Conrad. Uh, would have, or um, um, I don't know, as a as a as a poet of empire, Conrad is kind of the supreme uh, chronicler of that because he's an ironist and he's a critic, you know. So <clears throat> anyway, well, so time. I guess I guess we probably <clears throat> exhausted our subject now. Oh, I don't know For if we now. can ever, I don't know if we could ever exhaust the subject, but, 
I, I do have a, another commitment that I need to attend to, but I, I think this has got to be a fantastic introduction and overview to the text for anyone who's interested as always. I mean, yeah. Do a and there's job. a lot of, there's some good YouTube videos about Kipling's life in India. Yeah. Uh, one in particular, uh, you can easily find a Kipling in India. You can see, you know, where he spent time, uh, mainly in his, in the 1880s when he was a journalist there. I've got some of his other, I've got some of his poems on my reading list for this book I'm putting together. I've got, uh, in addition to, white man's yeah. burden but uh i want to dig it i want to kind of i want to do an analysis of mandalay i think and uh i believe there's yeah. another one called mother lodge that i'm i'm interested yeah. in digging into uh, have you read mother lodge that seems that no no i i need to read more more kipling's poetry but you you'll be pleased to know that if is the the britain's most favorite poem <laughs> oh no i don't doubt it i i if has been, uh, I've seen if in like a lot of political ads, yeah. uh, over the past year or whatever. I think, yeah. I think Trump used it in an ad yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So. God forbid. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Dr. Cook. I really okay. appreciate, uh, everything that you taught us today and I will have this hopefully edited up tonight. Uh, okay. And, and Good. thank you everybody for listening. Okay. Take care.